All right. I think we are live. Good evening, everybody. I am Frick, the technical guru behind the Rob Cosmic team. Um, Rob is still in hair and makeup right now, so just before he comes out, I just wanted to tell you guys that we read the comments from the last episode, and uh, we've made some improvements. So the number one complaint, I guess you could say, was uh, with the camera. And uh, unfortunately, you guys couldn't see it. We were using a webcam, and because the webcam doesn't have a screen on the back of it, I had to hold it on the end of a tripod and you know, look back and look at my laptop to see the screen. So obviously that uh, created quite a bit of shakiness and some bad angles. So what we've done is uh, we've purchased one of these guys. And what it allows us to do is to hook our camera directly up to our laptop uh, with an HDMI cable. And it's the same camera we use for our 4K uh, YouTube videos and our online workshops. And Jake is behind the camera, so it should be, um, it has a built-in optical stabilization as well. So uh, it should make everything a little more smooth and a little bit clearer as well and get some better angles. And that way I can watch the screen a little better. Um, other than that, we've, uh, we've installed a wired internet connection as well. So it could, should keep our connection strong and uh, we should have no uh, issues that way. So hopefully that fixes the issues. It is a, our first time trying everything, so bear with us. Everything should be good to go though. And uh, without any further ado, let's turn it over to Rob. I'm glad you gave them that list of things we improved. Michelle? What is she here? Oh, you know what? That heater's on. Okay. They can't hear that. Mm. Alright. So, yes we have it or no we don't? Okay. Go ahead and see if we should be good. Here you go. Do I need to start over? Yeah. Really? Yeah. Hi folks. Yeah. Pardon? So did they hear you? They, they did hear me. They heard all about the guru who has all the bugs worked out and how everything should work perfectly smooth? <laughs> yes. He's volunteering. Hi. So tonight we are doing dovetail issues. Issues with your dovetails. I'm going to let you carry the, uh, carry the show in the direction that you want based on your questions. However, I want to explain something real quickly and I'll go extra long for the uh, for in exchange for you helping me our purple heart project we bring in s um, seven combat wounded veterans four times a year so a total of 28 each year and we treat them to a week of very intense hand tool training we run from 8 in the morning until 10 30 11 at night this is Jake and I Colonel Luther and Super Dave and uh, it's fantastic. It's great. They benefit from it tremendously. We send them each home with $2,000 worth of tools. So it's a big part of what we do. In fact, it's a huge part of what we do. So I got an email just a couple days ago. I want to share it with you, and I want to tell you how you can help. This came from uh, Jack. Where's Jack live? Jack Lane. Oh, San Antonio. And uh, in San Antonio. And he was telling me about the fact that he recently bought a five and a half from somebody. And uh, he said... If you know anyone down this way that needs Wood River Plains, the guy that I got this from has a number three through a number seven minus a five and a half in mint condition. Mint condition. He's selling for 70% of new. Vietnam era vet, combat medic, and a great American that was exposed to Agent Orange and now has terminal cancer with months to live. Wants to sell out so his bride doesn't have to. Um, so I thought, you know what, 
I, I've, I actually have a thickness planer sitting behind Frick that I bought from, uh, from the widow of someone, uh, a woodworker who had died suddenly, a uh, uh, heart attack. And uh, she couldn't go in the garage because every time she went in the garage, she saw all those tools and she cried. I actually bought it from her son. So I thought, you know what, what, a, what, what a, we owe this guy something. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to feature one plane, tell you about it. It's not a bid, just whoever wants to buy it, speak up, and we'll write your name down and contact you afterwards. And then once Frick tells me that that one is sold, we'll bring out the next one. So we'll start with the number three. Now, we have some pictures of it, but I don't know if we can actually post them. So I'm going to just show you what a number three looks like. We have a buyer for the seven already. <laughs> well, this is going to be quick. Mr. Rob White has uh, volunteered to buy this. Is that Rob White from, uh, is that our Rob White? Rob, tell us if you're if you're the Rob White I know, combat vet. And Blake uh, Mackison has volunteered to buy the number three. Well, you guys are awesome, and I knew it would be like this. So the number three three is sold. So and the number seven is sold. So we have a number four. I didn't even get around telling you the price. So here's the number four, and um, we were told that they were in like I actually his name is Bob. I talked to Bob, I called him up and uh, talked to him and uh, he's, he's been keep, he keeps them in plain socks so there's no rust on them and they're in great condition. So we have a number four. No, sold. Oh, we have a number four sold, okay. So we have a number five. We have a number five, which is, if I have to take it out, I, is it gonna sell before I get it out? <laughs> this, is, this is fantastic, by the way. You guys, uh, you're doing exactly what I thought you would. You're just doing it a whole lot faster. The six, the six is sold as well. The six is sold. The five is sold. Okay. Okay. Well, we have a 62 low angle jack here. Didn't get this one out of the box. If you don't know what it looks like, go on the website. I'm not going to open it up because somebody's going to buy it before I get it out. What else is there? Does he have? Frick, can you go through his list of tools? Uh, I hope Bob. I hope you're watching, Bob. And thank you, Bob, for your service and for the sacrifice. And thank your wife for us, please. So the number 62 low angle, the 3, yeah. 4, 5, 6, and 7, the chisel plane, and the block plane. Okay, so, so uh, does it say a small chisel plane or large chisel plane? It just says chisel plane. Okay, well, it's either this one or the bigger one. 62 uh, is sold. 62. <laughs> yeah. There's a 5.5 that's sold. The 5 and a half's already been sold. Sorry. There's an 8 that's sold. No, there's no 8. Anything else? Yeah. Well, a block plane, the low angle block, does he have? Uh, well, I assume it's easy. Well, they almost look the same. There's the low angle block. So he has a low angle block for sale as well. Okay, so the way we'll handle this is do we have all this information? Who's, yeah, who's speaking for it? Okay, because. Um, uh, block plane, thank you. Who, who said that he would take care of this for us? No, Jack. Jack Lane emailed me the day and he said, Rob, if anything I can do to help, he will. So, Jack, I'm going to involve you in this and we'll uh, help you correlate with Bob. By the way, somebody said we shouldn't do this. I didn't listen. Okay, we got everything else? An anything else to sell for Bob? Uh, Paul wanted you to mention the guitar. Oh, yeah, thanks, Paul. So, this is uh, when I was down in. Knoxville, Tennessee. Actually, Paul Rigney, who is a guitar player, guitar maker, and works at the Woodcraft uh, in Knoxville, Tennessee, gave us, Jake and I, um, each a t-shirt that has his business on it. And he said, if you wear that on an episode, uh, we will, uh, he says, I'll make a guitar and donate the proceeds to the Purple Heart Project. So we eventually did. And the last time I was in Knoxville, which is just not that long ago, Paul showed me the guitar. A whole bunch of them got together and did it. And it's, there's all kinds of specs on it. And I apologize for not knowing them. Maybe Paul will email or, or tell us them. them. I just can't I remember them. Anyway, so the, uh, the bidding is up to 2000 the last I heard. And uh, if you want, I, I released a YouTube showing the guitar and uh, those guys playing it. We didn't do this last time. <laughs> all right, dovetails. Tip my hat to you guys. You're an awesome bunch. I feel privileged to work with you.
And make a heart project, or is that to Bob? It's to Bob and his wife to have a nice dinner. Wow. Awesome. Awesome. I hope Bob's on here. If Bob, if you're here, speak up we just so we can uh, acknowledge you. Any dovetail questions yet, Frick? Uh, there was a dovetail connect, uh, question at the beginning. What is your process on gluing <clears throat> dovetail joints? I've seen and heard many ways and opinions. What is yours? Okay, thanks. thanks. Um, well, you're kind of at, you're putting me at the end of the end of the uh, presentation as opposed to the beginning. Let's just uh, in the process of answering that, let's go ahead and cut one, and maybe that'll jog your memory, and you might in, uh, bring up a question. So I'm going to cut a couple, and I use northern white pine. And if anybody else wants to donate to Bob, don't hesitate. Don't worry about interrupting me. I use northern white pine for a couple of reasons. It's the warmest wood that I know of, and I say that. It just keeps getting better with age. All other woods oxidize to a point where they get ugly, even cherry, believe it or not. But pine just gets this honey patina, and it's just gorgeous stuff. What's that, Jake? <laughs> Speak up. I can't hear you. So I, uh, I use it because, A, it, you have to have extremely sharp tools to uh, cut it chisel it, saw it, the wood fibers will crush before they cut. And the second reason I like to use it, particularly in, when teaching, is that you have to be so careful with it. If you happen to pry against the side, you're going to leave a mark that you can't get rid of. So it teaches my students a level of finesse right out of the gate. Now, I'm using my shooting board and my five and a half, just put a new edge on it. First thing I want to do is I want to verify that it's cutting square it is I'm shooting the edges just a quick comment from Luther he wants to know who you, Luther he wants to know when you cut dovetails do you who's? often eat grits <laughs> who's Luther yeah. so that would be one retired Colonel Luther Sheely Who uh, is our uh, our uh, resident? Boss. Yeah. Well, he can't be a boss at home, so he gets to be a boss with us. Ooh, that cut. He says that we, when he eats a hot bowl of grits before cutting dovetails, dovetail, he gets better results. What can account for this? <laughs> with him, I have no idea. Okay. Okay. Don't read any more of Luther's. So this is a donation. Note. Oh. Brian Raz made a donation of twenty dollars for Bob. Thank you, Brian. Um, so what I'm going to do is I'm going to divide, now look at that, big old knot in there, doesn't matter, we only need the end. I'm going to identify this as the pin board, and this one is the tail board, a grit eater. Now, I've got my edges square to the face and straight. Now I've got to go in and I've got to, and I've got to square the end. So first thing I have to do when planing across the end grain of a piece of wood, you have to account for what's going to happen here. If you don't do something, the fibers will break off. So I'm going to pull the board away, go in here, cut a little chamfer. You can see it where it's nice and clean. Flip it over, and you'll see a gap right there. Can you get in on top of that, Jake? And you simply plane. Now, when I'm using a shooting board, I, I better explain that too. You're having to keep the plane upright, so you want to have your hand right over the wide part. It's, it's not, there's not a whole lot of surface area here, so it's easy to tip. Keep your hand right here. I take that meaty part of your palm and I jam it in that wedge-shaped area so I can get a better grip. Would that be another great benefit to the bedrock style? Um, it would be more flat surface? Well, actually, there's probably a little more on the, on the old Stanley if you looked at them. I haven't got one here. I've got some out there, but it wouldn't, it, there wouldn't be a whole lot of difference. I, so that, and uh, back to what I was saying. So you're pushing forward, pulling back. You're keeping the plane tight to the fence. You can't allow it to drift away. Now my shooting board, we actually make them and sell them. We square them up so that it's perfectly square in this direction. And I check to make sure because of the blade alignment in the plane that it's cutting square in this direction. That's the advantage of a shooting board. So you have to keep your plane tight. At the same time, you have to keep the wood fed into the plane or else it'll stop cutting. But you can't push this harder than you're pushing this that way. 
So comfortably pushing this way, holding it tight to the fence, the action of the plane will keep it tight to the fence and keeping it down on the surface of the shooting board. And you just go until that little chamfer disappears. Now you got a nice square edge. Do the same thing with the pin board. Pull it away from the fence. Cut your little chamfer. Now, I didn't mention it when I was doing that one, but if you go beyond that chamfer, you're still gonna cut fi break fibers out. So in looking down there and seeing that little groove or that little space, you just keep shooting until that almost disappears. You don't want it to completely disappear or you'll be in trouble. Maybe one more. Okay, so there's my two pieces. I'll put the plane over here because I'm going to use it again. Put the shooting board away. You Nothing coming through, Frick? These guys are all experts. No, That's they're, they're coming. They're just watching though right now. Okay. So, someone quickly asked, who is the maker of the saw hanging in front of the American flag behind you? That came from uh, Cody Bryant. Cody, that is... Uh, uh, R-Y-E-A-C, and I can't read the rest, New Swindon, Castile. I bought that at a, uh, I bought that at a f wood show at a flea market just because I wanted to have it. I got a couple more kicking around too. Don't, I, I've never bothered to look up the maker. Okay, so next task, you have to know how far down this piece I cut, how far down this piece I cut. We do that with a marking gauge. The easiest way to set your marking gauge, <clears throat> I used to have one that had a little O-ring in there, but I took it out because what I like to be able to do is to set the gauge here and drop it, and when I hear it, I lock it, okay? So that represents this thickness. These two pieces came from the same piece, so that what will work with one will work with the other. On the tailboard, you're gonna go all the way around. That means you're gonna cut the outside face, the inside face, and the two edges. If this were in a piece of furniture, I don't want to see marking gauge lines. So I would do a very light pass on the face side. Easy to sharpen the blade so that they cut cleanly. You don't want them tearing. You don't want them crushing. You want a nice, clean, severed line. So easy to set your chisel in there. It just registers it perfectly. Now, the other nice thing, too, is that if you were wanting to stop, sometimes what I'll do is I'll pencil in the dovetail and I can go in and I can simply run the gauge between or along the waist and then skip over to avoid having any line whatsoever. And if you've got an old pin style gauge, as soon as you put the beam down on there, you lose sight of the pin and it's all guesswork. With this, you can set it on and you can literally roll it that last little bit to get it perfectly where you want it. On the pin board, we don't remove the outside edges. So we only scribe the outside face lightly, inside face a little heavier, okay? So now we've got our two boards marked. I can put the gauge away. I'm gonna use it again, so I'm just gonna set it off to the side. Now what I prefer to do is to cut a little rabbit on the inside edge of the tailboard. And the reason is that it helps to register the two pieces. And with some of the new uh, techniques that we're using, it becomes even more critical to have that advantage of the uh, two boards registering one against the other. So in my or on my bench, I'm gonna take the tailboard and I'll hold that securely with the end just hanging over the end of the bench. I've got it laying flat. I'm gonna use, pardon? Brian Potter is asking, is there an alternative way to cut the rabbit behind the tails if you don't have a skewed rabbit tail? Yeah, let's go over here and do this one this way, Brian. So we can use our table saw to do it. Can you make it over here? You're tethered? You got 30 feet. You can show them uh, up there if you want to. I will. So you can use a table saw if you want. You could use a, you can, you can use a uh, shoulder plane. The problem is that you're cutting across the grain. A shoulder plane, a rabbiting plane, they cut perpendicular to the grain. And sometimes what will happen, and it'll just be a particular piece of wood, it's not any species and it'll, the fibers will tear and roll. And then you get a very rough surface here. Well, that rough surface, when it goes together like this, you're going to see that torn stuff is not gonna give you a nice clean line. If you have a table saw, you can set your fence to the, uh, I've just got it just a little bit below. I'm gonna take, not a lot. 
And I'm gonna go a little bit heavier than that. Right? Now watch to see how high it is. That's close enough. Now, because I'm doing it that way, I'm gonna come back and I'm going to uh, set my gauge off of that line on the front. And then I'll come in here and just deepen that inside, remember, tailboard inside. And then if there's still a few fibers hanging on, I'll just come in here carefully laying the chisel on there and just finish that off. You want a nice clean line right here. You don't want any crumbs that'll prevent that from working the way you want. And that'll become more apparent as we get a little farther into this process. Okay, any questions on that? Now, just for the sake of showing you, which I should do anyway, if I was going to use my skew block plane, I would have put the piece in the vise, held it securely. A lot of times with bench dogs, Jake, where's my hammer? Just tap your bench dogs and it'll pull everything down nice and tight. This is a skew block plane. I prefer the Lee, Val the Lee Nielsen version. And the way I've got mine set up, by the way, there's a steel plate that comes on this plane. I actually found it one day. I never use it, and I have no idea where it is now. Oh, there it is right there. There's a steel plate cover that goes on there. Now, I've taken it out because I only use this as a rabbiting block plane. It's a really lousy block plane because it wants to move off to one side when you're trying to use it. I set mine up so that the blade is sticking just out beyond the edge so I can catch that with my fingernail. And then I sight down the sole, and I want that blade to project evenly out of the sole. So I'm going to move the fence over so I can see more of the blade. Now you don't want to over tighten this. Now that looks to be great. Just snug but not over tighten. And I, the uh, plane comes with the metal portions. The wood portion you have to add yourself, yourself. But you want to have some registration before the blade engages and you want to have some registration after the blade leaves the wood. And that little short metal fence isn't enough, but there are two holes in there, and you can e easily add a, a wooden fence to it. So I'm going to loosen the fence. I'm going to move the plane back until that line, pardon me, that, um, that blade is right on that gauge line. Okay. Now, this is a little bit tricky to use. You, wanna, you want this surface to be lower than this surface, but parallel to it. So in order to do that, this is a fairly heavy plane and it's wanting to drop off like that. So with my left hand I, and my left index finger of my left hand, I'm pushing the fence tight against the end of the board. This thumb and this hand are kind of pushing like this to counteract gravity. Get that registered. You don't have a whole lot of surface area there, so you have to be sensitive to it. Got to be able to feel it. All the right hand is going to do is just push forward. And if it's set up properly, you should start to engage the wood immediately with the point of the blade. And I have people sometimes that will tip it like that. You don't want to do that. You want to keep that so the sole of this plane is parallel to that board. See, you start to pick up wood. You should maintain an entire a shaving through the entire process. If it doesn't, it might be, need to be sharpened. Now, because the blade is skewed, it keeps the plane going this way, which helps to keep it tight to the fence. And it's also your best bet for getting a smooth surface. I mentioned trying to use a shoulder plane or a rabbiting plane. Fibers will have a tendency to roll. Not always, but when you least want, when, when you don't want it, that's when it'll happen. Now that isn't quite enough, so I'll go in. And I should add that it's always better to take two or three light passes than to try to get it in one heavy pass. Now I'm gonna let Jake have a look at that because that is really clean. I got a question. Yeah. Does the fence on your skew box blocks wobble? And how do you improve that? Does it wobble? No, mine does not wobble. Well, tighten it on there. Now, I didn't actually do this one. This uh, Somebody else did this. Mike? Mike? So I would normally have mine. In fact, if you give me 30 seconds, I'll grab another one and I'll show you because I think mine is right out here. Oh. I 
thing was stuck. Well, I was going to say mine, I keep mine tight, but I don't. It could be tight to the bottom. If it is tight to the bottom, you see how I cut a little recess right there for the blade? That recess has to be long enough that it'll give clearance for the blade from here all the way over to here. So it's got to be, it's got to be, it can't be just narrow. It's got to be the full width. Width. Luther. Okay. Locked nice and tight. So as long as everything is tightened down, it's, it shouldn't move on you. Is there any reason to buy a bronze plane as opposed to regular steel? No, you know what? The, uh, the, what I don't like about the bronze is that uh, it'll leave, if you're not using it all the time, it oxidizes and it'll leave black marks. I don't have any bronze planes. I must have, oh, I got that one. It'll leave black marks on blonde wood. And the bronze is not as hard as the iron or the ductile iron, and the bronze cannot be ground. It has to be sanded. So the accuracy of your iron tools, if you're talking Lee Nielsen, is going to be better than it is on the bronze tools for that very reason. It, uh, the, the bronze clogs up the grinding wheel, so they have to actually sand those. Okay? Just keep interrupting me, Frick. I'm good with it. Okay, so we've got a tailboard prepared, pin boards ready. Now we'll do the layout. I normally would have this facing me, but since the camera's on that side, I'm going to have it facing you. We'll go in here and we're going to use a pair of dividers. We're going to use a dovetail marker. We're going to use a pen. Now, I'll, I'll use the, uh, the method that I typically use, which involves two pair of dividers. Red pen, just because on dark woods it shows up better. First thing we need to do is establish our outside half pin. And half pins, that's the, uh, the part of the joint that really sets the tone. If your half pin is too wide, I'm trying to look for an example. If your half pin is too wide, it'll make your joint look clumsy. And if it's too thin, it'll make it look really weak. weak. Now here's one that uh, Phil Gustafson, which is one of our first vets in our class, did. And his are almost the same, inside pins and half pins. And that's okay. In fact, that looks pretty nice. I wouldn't mind if it was a little bit heavier than that, but I certainly wouldn't want those outside half pins to be thinner than the interior pins. That was his first ever dovetail, by the way. I got a question from Bob Abbott. He said, you're working with soft white pine, but when, work, when working with hardwoods, specifically the soft hardwoods like linden or basil... Oh, leave it to Bob to ask a... Say, say, read all that again. You're working with soft white pine, but when working with hardwoods, specifically the soft hardwoods like linden or basswood, any things to consider different? Would you do anything differently? If I was working with softer woods or hardwoods? Soft hardwoods like linden or basswood. Oh. No. No. Um, no. Up to this point, I wouldn't. I wouldn't. Tools have to be sharp for everything, but I, I do have... I do have special chisels that, uh, that I use for really soft woods, which in this case would be pine, that are ground at 17 degrees. So they are, you cannot use these in hardwood. They are way, way too acute, and they'll just fold. But in softwood, they just go through that stuff. It's amazing how it cuts. Why don't you use a dovetail alignment board? Bob was one of our, Bob was, uh, Bob actually was, uh, is a comedian. And he kept everything light, and he was a, the life of the party at one of our most recent workshops. So if you don't know Bob, you missed out. Hopefully you get a chance to meet him. Bob has a show. What's Bob's show called? Coming Home, well. Coming Home Well. How do they find that? Is it on, is it on? Google Coming Home Well. Bob does a, uh, a radio broadcast, and Bob is funny. Go ahead. Sorry, Frick. Why do? Why don't I? Because I don't need to. I can't give you any other answer than the first one that comes in my head. I don't need to. So let me show you how it goes. And then that might become more apparent after we do it a little bit more. So we're going to do the outside half pins. And this is not something that I have any magic formula for. It's just a matter of looking at it. This joint, is th this board is three and a half inches wide. So I'm just going to look at that and say, well, you know what? That 
probably ought to, needs to be right about there. And all I can tell you is uh, save your samples, save your test pieces, and just as you learn more, look back and make sure that you're heading in the right direction. If your first joints look better than your hundredth joint, you did something wrong. Come to my class. So what I'm going to do right now is register one leg on the outside and then use the other one to leave a little mark on the inside of the board. Now I'm going to go ahead and pencil this in now so that you can follow along. Uh, on my dovetail marker, I have a seven and a six. That stands for a ratio of one to seven. So if you came over one inch and down seven inches, that angle is what the one and seven is, which translates actually into uh, uh, ten, eight degrees. Right? And then one and six is obviously over, over one, down six, and that one is 10 degrees. And I like that one. And I'll tell you the reason I like it. As I get older, my eyesight's not like it used to be. I can still identify, I can still identify the one and six slope from across the room as a dovetail, and I can't on the one and seven. It's just not quite enough, so I, I use it on everything now. So using the one and six slope, I'm going to put my pen in the hole, move the gauge over to it, square line across the end, starting on the gauge line, come up. Flip it around so I can do the other side. Same thing, pen in the hole, move the gauge over, don't allow it to move, square your line across the end, and come up. Okay. So there's my two outside half pins. Now I'm left with the task, how many tails? Anybody have a suggestion? How many tails am I going to put in a board that is three and a half inches wide, and are there any considerations that we need to take into account in laying this out? Anybody say anything yet? There's like a Come on, Bob. eight second delay. Oh. Well, there wait, uh, Bob says 17. Bob says 17? He would. Uh, says <laughs> three, two, three and two are the most common responses here. Okay, well, let's, let's eliminate one first. One big tail, a dovetail gets its strength, from long grain to long grain contact. So what I mean by that, we'll use Phil's other example. Anywhere this part of the board, not this part, that's end grain. So if you glue something onto that, you're not going to have much of a glue joint. You glue another piece of long grain onto this, and it's stronger than the wood itself. So what keeps a joint, or makes a joint strong, is where you have long grain touching long grain. So where the sides of the tails meet the sides of the pins, that gives the joint its strength. That's fine, however, you can't have too much and you don't want too little. If all we had was one dovetail on there, we'd only have long grain contact here and here, and that really wouldn't be enough. It might hold together, but it would not stand any stress. If we put in 17 bob, there would be so much of the tailboard removed because if you look at this, every time we put in another pin, we have to remove some of this board. So what I mean is, this board looks to be a little better than four inches wide. What is it? It's four and three-eighths of an inch wide. However, if we were to take a look at this board from end to end and say, where is its weakest point? It's a full four and three-eighths everywhere except right here at this baseline. Because at this baseline, we have removed a quarter of an inch here, a quarter of an inch here, a quarter of an inch here, and a quarter of an inch here. So we removed an inch. We take the strength of this board from four and three eighths down to three and three eighths. And if we put in Bob 17, we'd have very little of this left. We'd have a very strong joint from there above, but it's extremely weak along that line, and it would break. <clears throat> so you have to balance that <clears throat> on a joint. Pardon? A donation from Robert for twenty dollars, and a donation from David for fifty dollars. Thank you, Robert and David. Uh, that's a good question. Buy more chisels is the best answer. And the other one is we can pencil. We're going to pencil it all in before we actually cut it, so we can we can address that issue. And that actually is a good point. Let me get a little bit farther, and we'll come back to that. So I've already determined that we need more than one. Two, two would kind of be a lazy way out. It's not quite enough. It's okay, but you can go a little bit farther. Three is actually magical. I think the balance is nice. Now, don't this thing about odd number, even number. Look, there's always if there's an odd number of tails, there'll be an even number of pins. If there's an even number of pins, there'll be an odd number of tails. So that doesn't really matter. 
Three just looks is going to look good and best on this. Four, you just start to cross that line where it's looking a little too busy. So I'm going to take my other, that this is my divider that has the uh, half pin on it. Now I'm going to take my other pair of dividers and I'm going to open them up. And I have no idea where I'm going to start, but I know I need to get three tails and two pins between here and here. So I'm going to start <clears throat> on the half pin line. I'm going to go one, two, I'm being very careful not to leave any marks yet, three. Now, you see the distance from the red line to where that divider is? That's how big these are going to be. Now, I'm going to take you a little bit farther down the road before I stop to explain this, but it'll get, it'll, uh, the mud will clear. If I want it to be a little bit smaller, I close the dividers up. Not a lot, because every little bit you move here gets multiplied by the number of times you step. So on a large, wide board, a slight adjustment here can mean a whole mo lot by the time you get to the end. Starting again on the half pin, I'm going to step one, two. This time I just crossed that line by probably 32nd of an inch, maybe 16th. I wanted a little bit, a little bit bigger than that, so I'm going to open them up a little bit more. Again, starting on the half pin line. Careful not to leave a bunch of marks. Okay, I'm going to go with that. That's going to make it a little less than an eighth of an inch. So I can now go back here. This time I'm going to leave a mark. Not too deep because you don't want to have to work hard to remove a bunch of material in order to get rid of the mark. Okay, now <clears throat> take my dovetail marker, put the pen in the hole, move the gauge over to it. Square the line across the end. You'll come to find out that that is the most important part of this process, is squaring that line across the end. Turn it this way and go back the other way. Okay. Now, when I go to the other corner, there's half my layout. There's the other half my layout. That's why we, we use two dividers. And those PEC are the ones that we found. We like them. They're relatively inexpensive, and they're good. They stay put. And the, what are those, four inch? Four inch seems to be a nice size. Okay, next step here, come in and identify your waste. Identifying your waste means when I start to saw, I need to know which side of those marks, not these ones, but the straight lines, which side of them should I be sawing on? And mark all of your waste. Right? What's that? Oh, no, I wasn't going to embarrass Phil. Mm -hmm. We always have somebody in the class that brings up and shows us little candy stripes, how they kept them. They wonder, they wonder what's going on. You notice that he didn't uh, see something wrong there. Parts missing. You don't need to write. You don't need to mark on the back. <clears throat> a saw that will cut straight here and straight here is going to do the exact same thing on the back side. It's completely redundant. Don't need to do it. Put the tailboard in the vise. Now I want that to be down low. If it's up high, it vibrates too much. I want it to be standing plumb because that's my standard that I work to. You, uh, you do enough of this, and you'll, you'll come to be able to make plumb cuts, plumb cuts, angled cuts to the left and right just by feel. That only, works as if, that only works if the piece you're working on is standing plumb. If that's tilted four or five degrees, then everything else is going to be off. So why not make it easy on yourself and uh, just do that? It only takes a second. Put the square over to it. Oh, look how far I'm out. Actually, when I'm doing this on the road, I, uh, I put a level on because I can't always trust the floor. How do you feel about tapered dovetail saws? Are the ones you sell straight? Yeah. <laughs> I, actually think that, I actually think the taper, I've heard the stories, I think the taper came from multiple sharpenings over the years and somebody bared down a little harder on one end than the other and it ended up being tapered. I can't see any reason why it would be effective. Call me crazy. Okay, what are we going to do next? We've got to saw these. 
The only thing that has to be perfect is the square cut across the end. I don't care if the angles are off a little bit on the face, that doesn't matter. But the cuts across the end must be perpendicular. The entire joint will be thrown off if they're not. Okay, let's talk a little bit about saws. I won't promote mine because I don't want to turn this into a commercial, but if you want one, we have them. Three finger open pistol grip. This is the bird's eye maple one, by the way. Our standard one has a composite handle, which is, which is uh, same, same, see, uh, grab me one, would you please? Same saw, only difference is that the uh, work that goes into making the handle. Three finger open pistol grip, held as lightly as you would ha hold a baby's hand. If you squeeze it excessively, you're gonna, it's gonna do things that you don't want. Very, very light. Um, and that comes from practice too. That's one of the things that when I do a woodwork, or when I do a hand tool, a dovetail class, you find people and their knuckles are turned white. What you're lacking in control up through here, you try to over, you subconsciously overcompensate for out here. And you gotta learn to let that thing relax. This saw will cut laser straight and any good professional saw will cut laser straight as long as you're not trying to influence it by squeezing it too tight. Now, I like to have Jake, you might want to come down over here. On the quick question on the subject of saws, have yep. you ever used a large tank saw for dovetails? Have I ever? That's cross cut. I could. I could. The only the only disadvantage to doing that is on a tenon saw, you have a lot of distance from the tooth line to the brass back. So that makes for a little instability. If you don't, unless you don't, if you're not doing this a lot, then it takes a while to develop the wrist strength to keep that nice and stable. And this is a little coarser tooth. This is 12 TPI. Whereas on a dovetail saw, you're never really cutting very deep. So the less distance you have from here to that heavy brass back, the more stable it is. So yes, you could use this. It is a ripped tooth, same as that. In fact, it has the exact same set. So other than the fact that you'd have a 29 thou kerf because you've got a 25 thou saw plate plus two thou on either side, it, uh, it would perform the exact same way. But I'm gonna use my dovetail saw. This, this is the, uh, this is the um, what do we call this? Ebony resin. It's a composite, it's nice and heavy. It's actually quite a bit heavier than the, than the bird's eye. Okay, so Jake's gonna show you my feet. I want a nice, stable platform. Try to stand like this, you're wobbling all over the place. So I'm more than shoulder width apart, a little bit of bend in my knee, and it's a three-point stance. So one, two, and I always hold the board with my other hand, and I never let go of it. it now, the milking stool analogy is what I typically use. A milking stool has three legs. Most barn floors aren't level. If you had a fourth leg, it would always wobble. But with three legs, like a tripod, it always find, it's always nice and stable. Okay, so that's what I'm doing here. Now, I have to lean over enough so that that saw will lay underneath my elbow, underneath my shoulder, and I want a straight line that starts here, through my wrist, my elbow, up to my shoulder. If you're sawing like this, you're going to have a very difficult time getting a nice straight cut. So you need to turn your body enough so that your elbow will clear your side, and you can, like an old piston, like a piston on an old locomotive, you can make that nice, even stroke. Ah, it's just, it's so calm and peaceful and fun. Just relax. Don't get all stressed out. Grip the wood with your opposite index finger and thumb so that you have an anchor or a starting point. I should say an anchor point is what I meant to say. I'm rusty. Press the saw laterally against your fingertips. And I'm on the waist side. Remember, this is the side that I'm going to be cutting on. I want to save my line, but I want to cut on the waist. I'm going to line my saw up. Now, I don't want this. I don't want this. I don't want this. I want to see nothing but the complete line, in this case, on the right side of the blade. Now, I also need to have my angle established before I start. If you start sawing and then try to follow the angle, not going to work. You ha you're committed from the minute you start to push the saw. So if you were looking on that side, you'd see my, angle, my saw is parked at that approximately uh, 10 degree angle. And I, from now, I'm just doing it out of memory. But if you're new at this, you may have to just make the cut and suffer the consequences. If you're off a little bit, 
Oh, shoot. On this one, try straightening it up or correcting it in the direction it needed to be corrected. I'm using my little starter teeth. This is an advantage of my saw. It has little wee tiny teeth out the front. It has uh, their negative cutting face, so they're really easy to start. And that's the cr critical part of this process, is starting the saw with precision. If it jumps around on you, you're going to end up carving the thing out. We want to be able to assemble this right from the saw. Somebody asked me about gluing. What do I do different than others? I glue right from the saw cut. There is no paring, no touching the sides with a chisel afterward. Create an anchor point, index finger and thumb. Pinch with the bottom quarter of each digit. If you pinch down low, the set of the teeth are going to be cutting the end of your finger. If you raise these fingers, these digits up, now when I press the saw against them, they're touching above the tooth line, so I'm not having the set touch my fingers. Set it so that I have the saw parallel to the line. Now, if we weren't in position, let me just do one first. I'm going to move over here and we'll talk a little bit more. Get it just where I want it. Use a little teeth to get it started. Use the entire saw. Okay. Now, that one lucked out because it was the right angle. That came from a bit of practice. Wipe the sawdust out of the teeth so they don't drop on the line on, the next, on my next cut. Now on this one, if I were off, let's say I was like this. Jake, I want you to get back a little bit mm -hmm. further. So you can see, okay. If, if I'm off like this, okay, now pull back. If I were to try to change that by moving my arm, when I start sawing, I'm going to want to go back to where I was. So we have what I call a natural sawing groove, which means... Every time you saw, your arm is going to pretty much stay in that same track. Now, the secret to this is learn to get that sawing groove correct in the beginning so that you reinforce it every time you do it. If I come over, I set the saw down. If I'm not parallel to the line, I correct here, down here, which means I pivot around until the saw is now parallel to the line. I'm not moving this. This is fixed. I'm moving my feet down below, and it may be just a couple of a couple of uh, little wiggly things with my toes until I finally get it exactly where I want. So I come in here, again I have the anchor point, press the saw laterally, get comfortable, light grip, see nothing but the line on the right side of the blade, use the little teeth to get it started, already committed to the angle, and saw down, remember I made a really faint mark on here because it's on the uh, face side. Wipe the sawdust out of the teeth, Again, press the saw laterally. Get the saw lined up so that it's <laughs> parallel. Now let's show you how to check it. <clears throat> when you're first starting, what do you got going on? Super Dave wants to know if you're oh, okay. Oh, Super Dave. He wants to know if you're okay. Why? Oh. <laughs> yeah. It's cold here. I don't normally, but I had to. Thanks for, thanks for your concern, Dave. Well, I can't. I don't know where I have a registration. The, blade, the way the blade's angled, it's easier for me to see on this side. Okay, I'll try. So I'm using a, uh, a six-inch combination square, and I just, I'm just i always using the six-inch square, so that's where I, I find my reference. Okay. What? What's the matter? Just let me go over here. I'm going to set this against the uh, face of the board, and then I'm going to move it over. I left my saw sitting in there. I'm not touching the saw. Move it over and see how I did. Okay, now if I'm, uh, let me just see if I can. So over six inches, I might be out a 32nd of an inch. Well, that's nothing. You can be out as much as an eighth of an inch, and it'll still be okay. Any more than that, yeah, you might want to start over. So I've done all of my slopes this way before I, and, and the reason why I do that, by the way, is I often am working with a bench lamp. So I would have had the bench lamp positioned like this, so I can see on the right side of my blade. Then I only have to move my lamp one time, and I'm going to come over this way. Can I, can I work with that? Because I prefer it. Okay, this is going to be a little bit different. Now, if you're left-handed, you're going to be doing things the exact opposite. This time, what's going to change is if I keep my index finger and thumb like this, I'm not going to be able to see the, bla the, the um, line. So what I have to do is I've got to pull this thumb back to expose the line. And I kind of turn my hand around a little bit. I sometimes like to run off the end of my fingernail because it slides easier. 
I use my thumb to help anchor my finger. I'm looking down here to get that saw perfectly lined up so that it is parallel to the mark. Use all of the blades so that you're not having to sharpen your saw more often than you should. And if you're new at this, you might want to check every saw cut to make sure that it's within the tolerance on being square. Wipe the sawdust out of the teeth. Line up, get ready for the next cut. Explain why you wipe the sawdust. I think I already did, but I'll do it again. If you don't, you set it down on here and the sawdust ends up obscuring your line. So I want to be able to see it, so keep it nice and clean. Last cut, the saw in position. Now, talk a little bit about saws because I don't assume you all have my saw. What makes a really good saw? Uh, it's got to have a comfortable handle and you want a pistol grip. Here's why. If you are trying to use a saw, don't I have one here, Jake, somewhere? Mm -mm. I'll use the Kerfix 10. If you're using a saw that has a file handle, you never benefit from having it register in your hand. You see, I could turn the lights off, pick this saw up, and I automatically know where the blade is because of the handle. When you pick a saw up like that, you don't. And you're always having to follow or watch the line. Whereas you'll eventually get to a point with a pistol grip where because it naturally registers in your hand, you, you'll, from memory, you'll know plumb, you'll know 10 degrees to the left, you'll know 10 degrees to the right. Why not take advantage of that? So, pistol grip. Number two, it is a, we are ripping wood. We are cutting wood parallel to the grain, not perpendicular to it. So you want rip teeth. What's the difference? Well, rip teeth, when you file them, it's filed straight across. Cross-cut teeth are filed on an angle. These are, work like chisels. They knock out blocks of wood. They're very effective on cross-cut, on ripping, not quite as effective on cross-cut. It's probably more noticeable to try to rip with a cross-cut than it is to try to cross-cut with a rip. I can actually make cross-cuts with this rip saw, whereas a cross-cut saw cuts very slow when you're trying to cut parallel to the grain. So it has rip teeth. And probably the biggest thing is the set. Each tooth on this saw is bent. If the first one is bent that way, the second tooth is bent this way. And it just goes back and forth, back and forth, all the way down the blade. Why? Because your kerf, that's the groove that the saw leaves, must be wider than the saw plate. If it isn't, the saw will bind, and you won't get in there a sixteenth of an inch, and it'll bind on you. If you have too much set, and you have a big wide kerf, and you try to set, and as you're sawing, now your saw's wobbling back and forth. Well, that doesn't work. You're going to have to steer the entire time, and it'll leave a terribly rough surface. So if you have very minimal set, I don't know of anybody that makes them any narrower than mine. My set is just two thousandths of an inch per side. So what is two thousandths of an inch? A piece of paper is four thou. So the total clearance with my saw kerf versus the blade is just the thickness of one sheet of paper, half on either side. And what that does is once you start cutting, the kerf actually guides the saw and it will force it to cut perfectly straight. Now that, does, that means you cannot change the angle or the direction once you start, but you wouldn't want to do that anyway because how are you going to glue to a round surface? In order to get a good glue joint, in fact, I need, to, I need to show you that right now before we go any further. I always tell folks, I said, if you're just getting started in this, you need to test some of your equipment. Why work with faulty equipment not knowing it? So learn that right away. Get a piece of hardwood. I haven't got a piece right here in front of me or else I would. Get a piece of hardwood three quarters of an inch thick. Come in three quarters of an inch and make a saw cut as deep as your saw will allow. Then turn that on its side and cut that piece off. Here I'm cross-cutting with my rip saw. Now, a good joint is two flat, smooth surfaces touching. If you have a good saw, that will produce a good glue joint. So when I put these two pieces back together, they should almost disappear. I can spin it around, do the other side so we're not matching grooves, and you can't see the glue line because we have a nice smooth surface. So now when the sides of your pin come up against the sides of your tail, as long as you got your angles right, and that goes together, you get a perfect glue joint that does not need anything done to it. If your surface left is rough and you've got to go in and try to fix that with a, a chisel, 
you uh, you're you're lost before you start. Couple, so a couple of people have suggested you make a video about how to sharpen the dovetail saw. I think I did. I thought you did too. But yeah, if you if you search YouTube, I, I did. We did one. It's really easy to do. It's not hard at all. We may have done it on an online workshop episode, though. But not not on YouTube. Yeah, we'll check. Oh yeah. Thanks for the suggestion. Keep them coming. We need ideas. Okay. Any questions so far? We're at this stage. I'm not going to remove the waste. There's a delay, so I have to wait a second after I ask that. I'm just going to take my chisel and just get rid of this fuzz. So that when I set this piece on top of the pin board, it doesn't uh, interfere with the fit. Start setting up for this. Give them a chance to ask a question. All right. So I'm going to take my plane on its side. I'm going to take my pin board, put it in the vise, and I want it to be flush with the top of the plane. So I'll put a block in there and then snug this up. I want to do a uh, one of these live sessions on workbenches someday soon because uh, you got to have a good bench. All right. Pin board. This is the face side. I move my plane back and I'm going to create a little bridge. This is where I use the rabbit to come in here and register the two pieces. Okay? So I can move that along and it stays in perfect alignment. Nice and flush. Now, these edges needed to be square and you're going to see why momentarily. My next step, I'm going to move that for a second because I like to prefer I prefer to use this in my bench. I'm going to take my marking gauge. Now your marking gauge must have a cutter that is flat on the end. If you've got a round screw on there, it's not going to work. I take my saw, I'm going to set it on a flat surface. I'm going to go right out to the tooth line. Now I'm holding the marking gauge so that it's only on the saw. It's not touching the plane. And I'm going to drop it down. I like to be able to hear that. That's why I removed that O-ring. And I'm going to lock it. Now what I just did is I measured my saw curve. So that cutter is sticking up above the head of the tool by the thickness of the saw plate, which happens to be 20 thousandths of an inch. The set on one side and the set on the other side, which is 2,000 and 2,000. So that's 24 thousandths of an inch. And yes, that may be sound a little too precise for woodworking, but we like it that way. I'm going to put my tailboard on there. Now before I go any further, I'm going to grab my my dovetail marking knife and this has the little sawtooth blade in it. You'll see why. Now if this edge were not perfectly square, this would be thrown off slightly. What I'm going to do is I'm going to take that dimension. I'm going to set the head of the tool on ag against the edge of the pin board. The cutter sitting on top. Now I'm going to move that over until it touches. I'll remove this and I have effectively offset my tailboard to my left by the thickness of one saw curve. Now to make this a little bit easier, I'm going to go in here and I'm going to put a T for tail. Okay, These are the pieces I'm talking about. Now I'm going to go to the, because I moved my tailboard to the left, I'm going to go to the right side of the let me, tail. Let me <clears throat> You left. Okay. Mm -hmm. Now I'm going to take my knife, which happens to be the exact same setup as my dovetail saw. Same, same plate, same set on the teeth. I'm going to put that down the kerf, and then I'm going to. And when I put it down, by the way, instead of picking it through this way, I put it down in there, and then I lay it so it's level or parallel with the top of that and then drag it out. And I find that has less tendency to pull big chunks of wood out there. Right? I'm going to strike that three or four times to get a good mark. I'm going to go to the next one and I'm going to go to the right side of that tail. I'm going to do the same thing. And the third one. I'm holding this firmly with my left hand so that it will not allow it to move. Now I noticed the other day I was cutting some dovetails and some really thin stock and in doing this it caused the pin board to flex and if that's the case you may want to put a board in the front or back actually in the front to help support it. 
Now before I do anything else, I'm going to show you another little tip. We've already done a video on this, but we'll do it again. <clears throat> I'm going to take my saw and I'm going to carefully, actually, let's, uh, let's consider the, uh, the uh, aging eyes. And I'm not just talking about other people, I'm talking about me. I'm going to take a piece of tape. Remember, I, I made that gauge line really faint on purpose. So I'm going to put a piece of colored painter's tape on here to highlight that line. I just bumped that, by the way. So I got to put that back to where it was. So I'm going to hold this firmly. I'm going to take my dovetail saw and I'm going to carefully, and when I say carefully, I mean carefully. Let that register in the saw curve. And I'm going to saw. Now I'm being very careful not to extend the saw cut up here. And I don't want to go below the line. But what I want to do is I want to start that kerf on the pin board. And it's going to make life so much easier. Get rid of that sawdust. Go to the next one. You must have a very light touch with this. If you don't, you'll overpower it. You'll screw up the kerf on the top. Now, if you haven't figured out the importance of these cuts across the end of the tailboard being perfectly perpendicular, you should know now. And the last one. And I'm, I'm holding, Jake, can you show them how lightly I'm, I'm holding this saw okay. handle? Hmm? You keep letting go of it to let it re Yeah, yeah, I do. Thank you for noticing. I often will let go of the saw and let it find its way in that curve so I know I'm not overpowering it. Okay? Now, who, who, uh, who's our colonel friend? Charles. Charles. Charlie Ray. Charlie showed me. Char Charlie, I hope you're watching. Is Charlie watching? Get, good. So you sent me a picture, and you had some, uh, you had some issues. And one of them I, I, I meant to write you back was that if these edges are not square, that's going to throw things off. We're dealing with a level of precision here that probably was never done, done, done before in dovetails. This is literally under less than a thousandth of an inch. If this isn't square, that's not square. The way that cutter's going to touch is just going to throw you off enough. So you have to make sure when you're measuring your saw curve that you do it precisely. And I just don't, I don't do it on my bench because I don't trust it to be as flat as I want. As I do it right on the edge of the plane. Okay. You've got to be careful when you do this. You have to have that light touch and yada, yada. Yada yada, it's too much Seinfeld. Okay, so here's our next move. Somebody else asked me this the other day. Do I ever write, do I ever make the next adjustment from over here? The answer is no. Why? If there's any discrepancy in the width of the two pieces, by now measuring over here, that would have to be factored in. So instead, I always reference off the same side. This time, I'm going to put the head of the cutter, I'm going to move this over, on the side of the tail. Jake, do you want to be on the other side of me? Or can you see it from where you are? Head of the cutter, cutter underneath, okay? And then slide it back over until it touches. Now, the tailboard is offset by the thickness of the saw blade to my right. You can feel it. So now I'm going to go to the left side of the tail. Offset to the right, mark to the left. Offset to the right, mark to the left. Oh, sorry. Let me say that again. Said it again. I know. Offset to the right, mark to the left. Offset to the left, mark to the right. So I'm gonna, here's my tail. I'm coming in on the left side. Reach down. Now you'll notice that I reach down like that. There's the shape of the uh, sawtooth blade. So I know I'm getting right down in there. And then pull that out. And remember to drop it down so it's, it's level when you're doing it. And that'll prevent from pulling big chunks of wood out. final one. And that last little bit that I added, you don't have to do that. I just uh, I showed the guys at our last workshop and it's just so much easier. Carefully let it find its way. I'm having to watch two things at the same time. I'm having to watch my line up here and I'm having to watch that piece of tape so that I don't end up cutting below it. Keep that tailboard in place. Don't let it move. 
It's where that little rabbit really comes into play. I don't think there's any reason to clamp anything. You should be able to do this just with hand pressure. I'm wiping the sawdust off. How many? An hour and three minutes. <laughs> We're just getting started. <laughs> who said that? Roger who? Roger. Uh, Suitors? Okay. Any questions on this? Roger Scott. Roger Scott. Oh, yeah. Thanks, Roger. Remove that. Now, set this aside. Here's one of the advantages of this, this technique. If I happen to screw up this pin board, as long as I haven't done anything to this, I can go and cut another pin board and at least not have to go back and cut another set of tails. I'm gonna set this back out of the way. I wanna make sure that this is standing plumb because now I'm going to make my all important cut on the pin board. However, with this new technique, it's almost automatic. You could turn the lights off. What, what are you saying? Why, are you tired? <laughs> Poor Frick. Hockey tournament all day. Yeah, you were watching. <laughs> yeah. Okay, I'm going to identify my waist with an X. More, more so for when it comes to chiseling because the sawing is already automatic. I don't even have to draw lines down the front because I already have the saw curve. So now I'm going to set my saw in there. And this is another one of those situations where you want that. Actually, you know what? I'm going to bring this up a little bit. Yeah. So you can reference more in the... Yes, right? I want to be able to use more of that kerf. Don't you guys hesitate to ask Jake a question. He does most of the sharpening around here. Although we're talking dovetails. Luther's answering this. Oh, is he? <laughs> Attaboy, Luthy. Set that in there. You gotta let what you the the kerf that you started control the cut. Luther's a cruiser. Mr. Buffet, we call him. Right? Last one. Set that curve in there. Look at, focus here on how, how I'm holding the saw. I am I'm doing nothing more than pushing with the uh, with the web of my hand. I'm not gripping the saw at all because I do not want to influence where that saw is going to go. I want the kerf, the little kerf I started on the top, but more importantly the kerf down the face to literally control where that cut ends up. Now we're going to use our fret saw. And uh, if you, if you can't use a coping saw for this. We just produced a nice, smooth, ready to join surface. Don't get a coping saw with a big wide blade and go in there and wreck that. So that's why we use this little fret saw. The blade we use is a 12 and a half teeth per, teeth per inch, skip tooth. That means where there would normally be uh, three teeth, there's two. That just means the gullet is bigger so it'll clear the waste faster and cut faster. It's five inch long, it's a scroll saw blade. We, uh, we include a dozen of them with, uh, when you buy the saw. And in case you're wondering, that's hockey tape so that you can get a better grip on this. And what I've done is I've grabbed that blade and I've twisted it after I put it in place so that when I make a horizontal cut, instead of the uh, frame hitting here, now because of the twist in the blade, the frame stays up above the joint. And the teeth are designed to cut on the pole. And what I like about this little saw, when did I buy that break? I didn't even notice. Uh, is that it's rigid enough that you can get that, 
that nice and tight so it does not bow on you and you're pulling on it anyway. So when I put it in the kerf, I have to lay it over because of that bend so that it'll drop down. See, it goes right down there, doesn't mess anything up. Leave that tape on there because it allows me to see. As you start sawing, turn. <clears throat> now you got to remember the opening on the face side is wider than the opening on the back. So I'm starting like this and as I go I've got to swing around like so to avoid cutting into my pin on the back side. The closer you get to the line, the more efficient it's going to be because you'll do less chiseling. And if I'm going to make the cut anyway, why not make it as efficient as possible? <laughs> Anthony? Does the angle of the dovetail depend on the material? And also, some experts tilt their timber to make the saw cuts perpendicular. For no, or against. no, experts don't do that. I'm going to quote Jim Klingshot, who was a great English craftsman. If you ever get a chance to pick up his videos, he's dead now. But Jim Klingshot said, and I'm quoting, he that if... Anthony, oh, yeah, it's Frick, because he asked the question, but it's so you over here. <laughs> Jim said that if you have to tilt your board to make a plumb cut, you need a sawing lesson. You don't need to do that. You can learn all of this stuff. We have these, these guys, look, look at Marshall Rommel's first ever dovetail, almost perfect. Phil Gustafson, first dovetail. He did it in, in record time, too. Perfect dovetail. Luther's, Super Dave's. We get a class full of guys in here that have never cut a dovetail before in their life, and in that first day, they're cranking out perfect dovetails that you cannot fault. Anybody can learn to do this. If you can tie your shoes, and if you've got the interest, you can do this. Like I said, eliminate the tool issue, if that is, before you start blaming yourself. A lot of times, it's tools. There aren't very many tools that are made by people that actually use it themselves. And there, I say that because... Uh, if you use the tools yourself, you know what should be there and what shouldn't be there instead of just copying something from the past. Okay. What was this question? What was this question? Did I get all of it? Oh, yes. Um, traditionally, softwood, which will compress more readily, they would increase the splay. That's why they would use a one in six rake. And then hardwoods, which are stiffer, more robust, they would re relax the splay. But yeah, adhesives today are such that one in six, I just think looks great on everything. And yeah, don't tilt your board to make plum cuts. Who's faster at sharpening plane blades to a perfect edge, Rob or Jake? Who asked that? Luther? Grove, Groves Russell, Russell Groves. Well, I'll embarrass, I'll embarrass Jake. I, uh, we, we make these things, uh, half blind chisels. And these are all, these are ground entirely by hand. That allows you to go in when you're doing a half blind chisel. And I've done them for years. And I taught Jake to do it a couple years ago. And I look at what he does and I look at it and think, man, that is as precise as it gets. In fact, the average person would look at that and say it was done by machine. But that's, that's, uh, and he even perfected it that tech. It was done by a machine. Oh, yes, it was. <laughs> so now she speaks up. Um, that was with the old stones. Now that we've got these new, what are they CBN. called? CBN. That's, they're even better. So Jake, uh, Jake is as competent in sharpening. If I was, my ability to sharpen is where Jake is now, I'd be better than I am. Lost my chance. Okay, chisel time. And there's a lot to be learned here too. You, uh, I, I'm going to have to skip a little bit. We'll come back and cover chisel sharpening someday, but I'm using my 17-degree chisel. I hold my board so that I can see plum. So if you're looking right across me like this, I can see plum. I cannot see plum if I hold it this way. I want that to be plum or slightly undercut. Not a lot, slight. So what I'll do, and, and there's no reason to clamp this down. You're pounding straight down. I, I, I try to do things in a, such in an efficient manner only because I want to get it done. And I think craftsmanship is a combination of precision and speed. If it takes you all weekend to cut a dovetail, you deserve a kick in the pants, not a slap in the back. Get on with it. So uh, what I'm doing is I'm using my thumb to guide the chisel tip, wait for it to fall into that gauge line. It registers perfectly. Now, if you need to, you can put a square on there. That one's too big. 
I'll turn it this way. You can get a square on there and just kind of get a feel for where it is. But you can see plumb too. Get it on. One tap to register it and then one to sink it down there about halfway. Now, you see how close I got with my fret saw? This is good because I don't have to come in and do any extra work. If I had left more material than that, I'd have had to go in there and remove some of it because waste on this side, pushing on the bevel, has a tendency to push your chisel back and breach your gauge line, and you do not want that to happen. One of the big advantages of these 17 degrees is they're so acute right up there at the tip that they sink down into the wood enough to anchor the chisel firmly before that pressure starts to build up. The other way I do this too sometimes is I start here and I just drag it along until it falls in. And I'm, I'm up tight to the sides of my pins. Now make sure none of that debris falls. You always want a backup block, protect your bench. You don't want any debris in there that'll end up leaving a big bruise. So this is, this is good. I got really close on these. So what I'm going to do here, now Jake, I'm going to ask you to get it on that end, please. I find my gauge line, and once I get it there, I tap it, but then I tilt the, uh, saw, the, saw, the chisel forward. If I can find or follow that slope, I can completely eliminate a step. So I'm over tight to the pin. One tap to kind of register the chisel. Then angle it and follow that slope. Now the other side. And this is uh, the other big advantage to working this pine. And this is northern white. Is because it does not take a lot of effort to saw, to chisel you can concentrate on your technique without having to grunt through the process. Now, focus on there, Jake, and show them how clean those sockets are. If you've, if you've cut dovetails, Bob mentioned cutting them in uh, basswood and some other really soft woods, and what you'll have is a fractured mess in here where the fibers break. When you use that, it sounds like I'm selling you on this, but I am, because it's such an advantage. 17 degree chisel allows you to come in there and just cut those so clean. I'm working front to back. Now you'll notice this, let's, let's promote this too. See, I don't have any work to do here because that corner's clean. I don't have any work to do there because that corner's clean or there. This one I didn't get quite as good. So now I've got to come in here. I anchor the chisel with my left hand, holding it tight to the face of the uh, board. Actually, I got that one almost, and this one almost. There's just a little piece. Now, we want to make sure. <laughs> no questions coming up? Quiet bunch. What are, the, what are the new stones called again? Shaptons? No, the, uh... Oh, they're uh, the Wood River C CBN. I was calling them diamond, but they're actually harder than a diamond, and they're more efficient when it comes to grinding steel. They're fast, cool, oh, never mind. I did a video on it. Okay, so what I want to do is I want to check the base of that socket. If that's not flat, when I go to put the tailboard on there, it's going to get hung up on a high spot, and it won't close the gap. So a solid square, set it on there, and you should be able to move it side to side, and it should only touch on the outside. If it rocks, this is, not a, this is the one time you don't want things to rock. I don't feel any movement. Now, and something else you can do too is use the side of the chisel to check. Do you see the this side of the square? Sorry, by keeping that flat on the bottom, I can move it over, and it should make contact all the way along the side of that pin. If it doesn't, you're not going to get a good tight fit. Okay. Now I'm going to set this aside. So I'm happy with those pins. I say that because if I wasn't, I may have to cut another set. If I'm once I'm satisfied with that, I, okay, now I can go ahead and I can process the tailboard. Same thing as before. Lay, lay it over till it drops down. Come up just off the bottom. Actually, I'm going to put a piece of tape on here too. It's that line is so faint. OK, 
Okay, drop it down to the bottom, come just off the bottom, and then turn and saw. All right, take that off. Now we're going to lay this on its side. And this is the part that is really visible. And I'm going to show you why I say that. When you open up a drawer, you see that joint right there. The minute you open it up, you can hide a little gap down here, but a bad joint there shows up terribly. So you want these to be perfect. So to do that, I'm going to come in here with my chisel, starting in the waist, and I'm going to Remember I said make that really deep? I'm going to cut a little V groove like that. Now I have a wall that I can reference my saw against that will give me great registration. And all I have to do now is make that plum cut. But I don't have to worry about the perpendicular. And you can tell when your saw is registered against it. Closes the gap. Light touch, very light touch. And yes, I'm cross cutting with a rip saw, but I've scribed a line on all three sides, so I don't have to worry about tear out. Flip that over. Tony from Melbourne says hi. Ah, Tony. I'm getting your t-shirt ready, brother. That'd be Tony Martin. Now, Tony was played an instrumental role in us starting the Purple Heart Project. He was, he helped just, he helped, uh, he rallied the troops and we got a bench for Jesse and he's been a big supporter of it. Tony was actually here making wood hinge boxes back in September. And he brought us out. And he survived Luther for how long? They drove across the country. <laughs> Just kidding. And he brought us Ash. Yes, he did. Ash is a, uh, uh, an Aussie vet, a digger. They came to our workshop this last time, and uh, Tony's the one that found him, and it took some digging to get him, no pun intended. Great to have you, Tony. And Mitch said, uh, thank you for wishing him a happy birthday. All right, now, I've got to come in here, and I've got to make sure that there's no wood sitting on top of that gauge line. If there is, when the joint goes together, it's going to push it apart. So I'm looking carefully at this. And I can see a little bit right there. So I'm going to put that in place, or in the vise, using two hands to secure it. You can see it right there. I'm just going to come in here and get right into that corner. Now, you usually have to do this anyway because your saw will not go right into the corner without scarring the side of the pin, the tail, sorry, because uh, it's a sloped corner and your saw cuts square on the bottom. Now, you never pry like this. If you do, especially on pine, you're going to bruise those edges. Okay, so those are nice and clean. Does anybody have a Kleenex? Do we have any? Even a piece of that coarse blue towel. Yeah, from? I got, never mind, I got one. I got Megan. He says, some people say that pine is not a good wood. Learn cutting dovetails. Is that true? Some people say. <laughs> I love it. My wife always says, they. They say this, they say that. Who are these experts? They all have the same name, they. Well, I'll reiterate what I said earlier. I think pine is the best wood for learning dovetails on because it two things it teaches you. Number one, it teaches you you have to have sharp tools. You try to do this with a dull chisel, a chisel that's Sharp enough to cut a hardwood will not cut pine. The fibers will crush instead of cutting. And number two, if you were to pry with your chisel or any of your tools against the edge of pine, you're going to leave a mark. So you have to learn to be very careful with them. You could get away with that on a piece of oak or a piece of maple, but not on pine. And actually, there's a third reason, and that is it's easy to process, meaning it doesn't take a lot of effort to chop it, doesn't take a lot of effort to saw it. So it allows the new person to focus on their technique without having to put all that extra effort. Remember this when it comes to hand tools. The more effort you have to apply, the less control you have. Effort and control are in, invariably connected. Inversely. Inversely, sorry. Harder you push, less control you have. Actually, this is the 
mix that up. This is the control over here, and you want to have 100% control with your hand tools. This is the effort you have to apply. Keep your effort down low, your control stays high. That, by the way, is how I teach sharpening, because if you keep your tools 100% sharp, requires the least amount of effort, gives you the maximum amount of control. How's that for an answer? All right, back to this. Let me know if it worked. I'm going to get my quarter inch. This is, again, my 17 degree. So I don't need that big, heavy mallet. I'll use my little one. Set that. This is another spot where the, uh, the little uh, rabbit comes in handy because it gives you such a positive shoulder to work against. Tony, I should have been cutting these in jacaranda, but we're all out. When Tony came up, he brought a bunch of uh, local woods with him. And jacaranda was a new one to us. And you never did tell me if your wife liked the uh, jewelry box you made. Now, I can barely see this line, so I'm... Holy smokes. Let's go in there and do what I was telling you about earlier. So what I'm going to do is take my, chis my uh, gauge and try to find that line. Oops. Use the other side with the big. Oh, yeah, all right, good idea. Right up against the shoulder. Now I can go in and just in between the tails, just roll it to get from side to side. Now I can set my chisel in there. Second, I need to move this over here. Oh, watch your hand. And just chop down until you feel that meat. We're getting to the end. You better ask your questions if you got them. Now always work front to back. That way if I, if I blow something out, at least it's on the inside of the joint, I'm making sure that the inside corners are nice and clean. All right, now if I get the light in there, I can see a little bit of debris left. I don't want that to interfere with the fit. So I'll clean it up now. Last step, using my chisel, I'm going to step inside. This is on the this is the face side. This is the inside. On the inside, stepping in about a sixteenth, I'm going to cut a little chamfer down the inside corner. Now, if any of you are anywhere near uh, Ventura, California, we're going to be doing a class on this uh, next Saturday. If you're a vet or you know a vet, there's a free class for them on next uh, Thursday. It's an all day. It covers hand plane, sharpening, chisel sharpening, dovetails, the whole bit. You need to call the store to register if you're coming to the other class. Actually, there's only 12 spots in all three classes. So that Friday is a uh, sharpening and hand planing class. Okay, this is done. This is done. Put the pin board in the vise. Now I, I need a spatula. It's got dried glue all over it. I need some glue. I need, I'll use a mallet. I prefer a hammer, but I don't know where my hammer is. Seth wants to know if you'll ever get tired of teaching dovetails. Never. Never. Love it. It's such an interesting, if you're into this, it's such an interesting topic. How can you get tired of having people that are sitting on the edge of the seat waiting to see what's going to happen next? You know, I can't tell you how many... I, I know I've taught over 4,000 people in actual workshops, demonstrated to uh, multiple thousands more, and it's always fun. I, I love cutting it. I, I, I don't know how many times I've done this, but I enjoy, thoroughly enjoy it, and I love seeing it come together. All right, so what we're going to do is apply glue just to the long grain surfaces. I think we're going to apply glue. A 
butter that on there like you would peanut butter on toast. You don't want it too thick and it sticks to the roof of your mouth, but you don't want any area not covered. How's that? Now that's on the tail, on the pins. I do the same thing on the tails. Nice light coat. How long have you been teaching ducktails? Uh, we started at, uh, n at 8 o'clock Eastern. I taught my very first class, if that's what you're referring to, which I guess you are, in uh, 1987. Okay, a little bit on the on the shoulders, even though that's end grain. I always like to do that. Don't know why, but I just do. Put it in position. No test fit. We already know it's going to fit, and then tap it home. What? Grab your paper towel so it doesn't splatter on oh. Like that? Yeah. The advantage, by the way, of a, of a rubber mallet, I've come to find out, is that in pounding on it, the end grain pins will go up into the mallet and uh, and yet the mallet will still make contact with the um, softer what am I trying to say yeah this is hard this is soft so the mallet will push on that instead of I really need my hammer I'll use this this one now what I'm gonna do I want to get right in next to the pin like this If you do this, you have to make sure that you set the uh, piece of wood right beside the pin. Because if the glue starts to tack, you push, if you were to have a, a piece of wood sitting out here like that, and it pushes down, anything that's already tacked here will cause that to split off. So you don't want to have that happen. Check the back side, make sure that it's it's uh, seated, check it for square, and then flush it up. A little wax on the sole to reduce the friction. Should you mention how much planing it up changes the look? Well, usually when we teach a dovetail class, the guys in the class are not that proficient with their plane. And they kind of, in the process of cleaning it up, they have a tendency to hack it up pretty good. So I'll come over, and they're, they're oh, that's okay. I come over with a sharp plane and run the plane over it, and it's like, oh, my goodness, who did that joint? So it makes a huge difference when you clean it up. Now I'm just going to plane until, what is that? I'm going to plane until all of the uh, marks are gone. Uh, I can still see a little bit of the gauge line. Flip it over and do the pin board, or the pins, end of the pins, end of the tails actually. But I'm calling it the pin board. Would you recommend a dual marking gauge or a single? Single. Want a brand recommendation? Okay, now we want to flush up the edges. So I'll set my plane on here, wait for the blade to make contact with that high surface, and then just push it straight forward. Jumped. jumped. A little bit right there. Okay. Now, let me get a little bit of, uh, you can have a look at that, but I'll make it stand out a little bit better. A little bit of wax. This just makes the end grain stand out so you can see it a little bit better. Now, 
I remember when I first started doing this, teaching teaching wood shows, and uh, nobody had been doing it you know, on the wood show circuit. And here I was cranking them out, and Erica would have been about 13. She would come and work the shows with me. And she would say, Dad, when you were putting that together, some of those guys looked like they were going to cry. I said, Erica, you don't understand. The holy grail of dovetail. Let me know if you're one of the ones that shed a tear. All right, we'll put the camera on that and the light and let you critique it. Have a close look. Ask your questions. Is it too bright? No test fitting. Why do you not test fit? Because if you test fit, then you've got this crutch that you're leaning on and you don't have to check yourself along the process. If there is no test fit allowed, then you make sure before you proceed to step C that step B and A were correctly done. And if, you've, if you have any confidence at all in what you're doing, you have the ability to verify the steps you just did were done properly, so it has to fit. If you test fit, you risk bruising it. It really only goes together well one time. And uh, I like what Alan Peters said. Uh, Alan Peters was my mentor. Alan was, uh, I think, the best designer craftsman of the last century. He died several years ago in England. But Alan said that, uh, he said, if you couldn't assemble your dovetails right from the saw in our shop, he said, you would be the guy sweeping the floor. So it doesn't take, I don't allow them to do it in the class. They have to do it right from the saw. You develop that confidence from the beginning. If you, if you allow yourself to test fit, in the beginning, you will never be able to drop the habit, or it'll be very tough to do. Just go for it. Do it. And if it doesn't work the first time, figure out what you did wrong. And then you can start doing these things with the kind of speed that allows you to get things finished in a weekend instead of six months. You see guys cutting their fingers on the stone when hand sharpening? Yeah, it's it's easy to do because uh, I've worn it, worn through without even realizing it. Um, it's a very subtle, very subtle fine stone, and it's uh, yes, it's easy to do. And the edges of the stone are very sharp too. You just have to develop some calluses to it, and you got to be a little bit careful, I guess, pay attention to what you're doing. But even then, it sometimes happens. You mentioned an extra blade ground to a higher angle. What angle would you use and for what application? A uh, bit of a different topic, but that's all right. We'll cover it. What, what, but we do need to know how long are we going? About an hour and 40 minutes. Are we really? Okay. So we'll wrap this up in the next couple of minutes. Um, if you're dealing with figured wood, and by that I mean uh, wood that has a lot of curl in it or fiddleback, Anything where the grain is reversing, and in case you don't know, fiddleback maple, which is that stuff that was showed up on the backs of fiddles. He's got it right there. Where? Yeah, here's a piece. Okay, so if you look at that, what you're seeing is the grain's going different directions, and that's why the light reflects differently, and you get that almost iridescent look. Uh, this is well treated with a high angle blade. Exotic woods that just do not respond planing are well treated with a high angle blade so that's where I typically in fact I'm making uh, I'm making uh, some uh, purple heart dovetail markers for our we a uh, little promotion we have a purple heart package where if you donate $250 to our purple heart program which all goes to it we donate how much is it how much hundred and hundred and fifty two fifty two yeah the, the, the donation is 250 but how much product do they get but $175 worth of product, we will give you. We donate it, you get it. And one of those is a Purple Heart dovetail marker. And uh, this stuff is a bare to plane. So I had to make a, a high angle blade for my 10 and a quarter, which is the bench rabbiting plane. So it's got a 20 degree back bevel on there so that I can plane this stuff. Miserable, miserable wood to have to hand plane. You have to have a high angle. And yeah, well, yeah, isn't that what he's referring to? We, we now, we actually, Luther just put that up today. So we now sell 
on our site, we sell, Jake's getting it for me because Jake's the one that does them. So you buy a high angle blade like this and it comes, how many times have you taken this apart? I took a picture of how many times. We sell it with the chip breaker. I'll get oil on it. So the back has been prepared. There's your 20 degree back bevel and it's done all in Shapton. I mean, it's extremely precise. Taken up to 16,000 grit. Uh, oh, how wide is that? Do you remember? Millimeter and a bit? A couple millimeter? So it's prepared on the front. The chip breaker's on there as well and that's been prepared so you can drop that right into your plane. And now the way it works is whereas a normal plane planes the wood or presents the blade to the wood at 45 degrees, because there's now a 20 degree back bevel this way, you add 20 to that, 20 degrees to that. So now you're planing at 65 degrees. That's what we call a high angle. The alternative to that would be to buy a plane that either has a replacement fog or here's an infill made by, by uh, Ron Breeze, a fellow I met down in Atlanta. And that I believe is a uh, 50 degree. I said 55 the other day. This is a 50 degree, degree pitch versus a 45. Beautiful plane, by the way. I think you're saying that you should demo how to check your pins and tails for correctness before assembling the joint. Yeah, didn't we kind of do that? Well, we were running out of time. But what Luther's talking about, remember, remember I said, he, he missed it. I put, the, I put the, the square in there and then moved the square over. So when your square is laying flat on the socket between the pins and I moved it over, to make sure that it was tight all the way around. That's how you check to make sure that your pins are properly done, the walls are plumb, and it'll go together like that. Now you look at that and say, wow, I could never do that. You wouldn't believe how many people in our class come in May, May 6th, will produce a joint comparable to that. You wouldn't be able to tell them from mine. By the way, I do have to mention that. We have, a, I think we may have one or two minutes left. May 6th and May 13th. We are teaching our Purple Heart Project, training the hand, here in our new shop. Take a quick peek out here, since we can now wander a bit. We're just in the process of putting this part of it together. We'll have 14 benches in here, and uh, we've installed, we've started installing the lighting. It's going to be extremely well lit. The benches, actually you can see the benches in here a little bit better. Everybody will have a... A uh, really sturdy bench. That's my uh, my MDF plywood bench. That is nice and flat. Has a Schoberg vise on it. It's great. They've been used to several classes. So if you're interested in jump starting your hand to a woodworking, I promise you this class will put you three years ahead of where you can get on your own, maybe even farther. That's May 6th to the 13th, and that May. No, May 6th to the 10th, and then the 13th to the whatever that is, Monday to Friday. Lots of information on our website. Final appeal, if you know any combat wounded veterans, we give a lifetime membership to our online workshop. We broadcast three 45-minute episode, training episodes every week. Right now we're building this. This is the prototype of a standing desk that Frick is working at. This is how we design, just with a prototype. And now we're going to start, we're actually starting it in Cherry. Um, it's $325 a year to have the full membership. We give that to any combat wounded veteran for free for life. All they have to do is contact us and we'll take care of it. We also bring combat wounded veterans into our workshop. We have to find them. In order to apply, if you go onto the website under PHP and drop down menu, Luther's got tons of information in there. Tells you how to apply. And uh, we're still taking applications right up until the end of February for our classes in, in uh, May. And then we'll go to work on taking applications for our classes in October. Anything else I'm forgetting? If you'd like to donate and help, I need people more than I need money. Yes, we can always use funds. That's great. And it's a wonderful way to, for you to be able to participate. But what I really need is you to find these guys that need this help because they do, are not standing on the street corner waving a flag. They're most likely held up in their home. They need somebody to know them to make them aware of what we're doing. And we bring them in and uh, amazing things happen in five, six days. It's incredible. And I, don't, I know nothing about it. I'm learning this by the seat of my pants as I go. All I know is that it works and we're going to keep on doing it. This has been fun. 
Uh, what's our topic for next time? Well, we got a lot of suggestions. Uh, someone wants to see you sharpen the skew block plane. Someone wants you to talk about if it's possible to convert your assembly bench to have a vise like you have on this. That would obviously take too long, but there's a challenge issue to you. Uh, you know, we need to build another bench. Um, well, I, I'm not going to make the decision tonight, but we will over the course of the next week. Am I even going to be here for in two weeks' time? Mm -hmm. I am? Good. So our next one will be two weeks from yesterday, which would be Friday night, I think. We'll, pl we'll let you know. Okay. Am we sign? Yeah. So there's lots of them. We're going to keep doing it. Let us know what you think. Contact us. And what are you saying? Megan, would you like to wrap this up for us? You get quiet real easy. Okay, see ya.